lecture is going to explain how money is created in a fractional reserve banking system. A fractional reserve banking system is when banks are required to keep only a fraction of their total deposits on reserve. Any excess reserves or deposits that exceed that which is required can be loaned out to borrowers who can invest and spend the money in the economy. As we'll see in such a system, a particular amount of money can be multiplied through the creation of new money as it is loaned to borrowers and spent by those borrowers on goods, services, or new investments in capital. In order to understand how money is created through a fractional reserve banking system, we're going to start with the assumption that there is a business, an industry, in which goods and services are produced. So in our upper left-hand corner here, we have our businessman and his factory. Now this businessman employs workers in the production of goods and services. Upon the sale of this factory's output, these workers will be paid. So as we see here, we have a thousand euros, which this factory owner has earned from the sale of its goods and services and is going to pay to its workers. These workers will spend some of this money and they will save some of this money, but ultimately any money spent or saved by the workers at this factory will end up being deposited into hypothetical bank A. So bank A is a savings institution at which the workers in this factory and the people who receive the money that they spent from the production of their goods and services are saving their money. So as you see, there is an increase in bank A's total reserves by 1,000 euros. Now we have to ask the question, what is the reserve requirement in this economy? In other words, of this 1,000 euros, how much is required to be put into reserve? Let's assume that in, in Europe today, the ECB, or the European Central Bank, has set a reserve ratio of 0 0.2. This means that 20% of all commercial banks' deposits must be kept in reserve at the European Central Bank. So we have 1,000 euros has been deposited from the workers earning the money due to the production of the goods in this factory. Of this 1,000 euros, 200 euros must be kept on reserve at the bank. So we'll move 200 euros over here. Now this leaves 800 euros, which this commercial bank has in its excess reserves. The question is, what will the commercial bank wish to do with these 800 euros of reserves? Now the savers at this bank are earning interest on their savings. In order to pay the savers interest, Bank A must earn interest on their reserves. So Bank A has 800 euros that it wants to loan out so that it can charge interest to a borrower. Now the availability of this financial capital will not surprisingly attract new capitalists. So let's assume that another entrepreneur comes and borrows 800 euros from Bank A's excess reserves in order to pay for the production of goods in his own factory. So this 800 euros will go towards the production of goods and of course the employment of more workers. The 800 euros will cover the production costs of this new factory, will be paid to the workers who will then spend some and save some and ultimately the 800 euros will end up being deposited into other banks in the economy represented by bank B. So as we see the 1000 euros earned by the workers in the first factory will ultimately lead to an additional 800 euros of money being created through the fractional reserve banking system. Bank A is able to lend out 800 euros of the initial 1,000 euros deposited to another businessman who pays his workers who will spend some of that money which will go into other banks in the economy as reserves. Now we have 800 euros in Bank B. With the reserve requirement of 0 0.2 Bank B must set aside 160 euros into its required reserves. So let's count out 160 euros here. There's 100 and we've broken this up into some chunks. That's three fifths of another 100. That's 160 euros. Now this leaves 640 euros in Bank B, which are excess reserves. What is Bank B going to do with its 640 euros of excess reserves? Of course, it wants to loan this money out so that it can charge interest to borrowers and earn a profit by paying its savers a slightly lower interest rate. The availability of excess reserves in Bank B attracts new borrowers. So we'll have yet another borrower join the market, borrow the 640 euros, use this money to pay for the production of goods and services and for the employment of yet more workers.
who will get paid the money that the capitalist has borrowed. And ultimately, this 640 euros will, you predicted it, be deposited into yet more banks in the banking system. Now there are 640 euros in the banking system that were created through Bank B's lending to another borrower. With the required reserve of 0 0.2, 128 euros must be added to Bank C's required reserves. So we'll take another 100 out and another piece of this here. Now we have 128 euros in required reserves, leaving Bank C with 512 euros in its excess reserves. Of course, this process will continue. Bank C will lend out its excess reserves to yet more borrowers who will spend that money on the production of goods, employ more workers who will spend that money, and it will ultimately be deposited in yet another bank. All along the way, more money is being created. Now, how can we actually say money is created even though this whole process started with an initial deposit of just 1,000 euros? In fact, the money supply in a nation is not simply the base of currency that exists. Rather, it is a multiple of that monetary base. In this economy, there's only 1,000 euros of hard currency. However, a nation's money supply includes all the money that exists in checking accounts and savings accounts in the banking system. Therefore, with the reserve ratio of 0 0.2, there is actually a multiplier effect when there is an initial change in deposits in the banking system. In this economy, to determine the total change in the money supply that resulted from the initial change of 1,000 euros, we, no, we must calculate what is called the money multiplier. The money multiplier is found by dividing 1 by the reserve ratio. In our economy, the reserve ratio is 0 0.2, so the money multiplier is 1 divided by 0 0.2, or 5. This means that even though there's only 1,000 euros of hard currency in this economy, the total money supply can be a multiple of that 1,000 euros due to the fact that commercial banks are only required to keep 20% of their total deposits on reserve at any given time. Money is being created through the lending and borrowing from banks' excess reserves and the new deposits that are created by any money that is lent and borrowed. The total change in this money supply following the 1,000 euro change in deposits at the beginning of this process will therefore be 1,000 euros times the money multiplier of 5 which gives us 5,000 euros. Now this is a little bit misleading. One assumption we've made is that the initial change in checkable deposits or the change in the bank's reserves of 1,000 euros was not already part of the nation's money supply. In fact, if we take into account that the original entrepreneur used to pay for the manufacture of his goods and to pay his workers was already part of the money supply, then the actual change in the money supply will be 5,000 euros minus the original 1,000 so we have to actually subtract out the initial deposit of 1,000 euros because we have to assume that the original entrepreneur got that money from somewhere and it was probably already part of the nation's money supply. So as we have just shown, when there is an initial change in deposits in a commercial bank, the ultimate change in the money supply will exceed that change in deposits since commercial banks are only required to keep a fraction of their total deposits on reserve. 80% of every euro deposited into Bank A could be lent out, spent or invested, earned by somebody else in the economy, deposited into Bank B, increasing that bank's required reserves and its excess reserves. Since banks can always lend out their excess reserves, money is being created along the way here. The total change in the money supply will be a multiple of any initial change in deposits in a commercial bank. Now this raises the question, what if the initial change in deposits comes not from a private investor, as we saw in this activity, rather from an action taken by the central bank? Let's assume, for instance, that rather than the increase in the deposits of Bank A coming from a businessman's business activities, instead, the supply of reserves in Bank A increases because the European Central Bank buys bonds from commercial banks.
Now, what's the difference between a bond purchase, which was explained in a previous video lesson, and its effect on the money supply? How is that different than when the initial change in deposits in the banking system comes from private investment from an entrepreneur? In fact, as you may recall, money held at a central bank is not considered part of the money supply. Therefore, when the European Central Bank buys bonds, which is an open market expansionary monetary policy, the supply of excess reserves will increase just as it did before by 1,000 euros. At the same time, the required reserves will once again increase by 20% of 1,000 euros or 200 euros, leaving 800 euros of excess reserves for Bank A to loan out. However, the difference now is that the change in the money supply will be equal to the initial change in deposits multiplied by the money multiplier. So in this case, the total change in the money supply will equal 1,000 euros times the money multiplier of 5, which is 5,000 euros. Now, why when the private individuals put 1,000 euros into the banking system, did the money supply only increase by 4,000 as opposed to when the central bank buys bonds, does it increase by 5,000? This is because money held at the ECB, it was not counted in the nation's money supply. Therefore, the central bank's purchase of government bonds increases the money supply by more than when a private spender or saver puts money into the nation's banking system. So this is the conclusion of our lesson on the fractional reserve banking system and how money is created through a system in which commercial banks must hold only a fraction of their total deposits on reserve. When a bank loans out money that is saved in its institution, it creates new money. For this reason, the total change in the money supply resulting from an initial change in deposits in a commercial bank will be a multiple of the initial change in deposits. The money multiplier is always 1 divided by the reserve requirement. So we can learn this tool here. The money multiplier is 1 divided by the reserve requirement. Multiply this by the initial change in deposits and you will get the total change in the money supply. But keep in mind, if the initial change in deposits comes from an increase in savings from private spenders or savers, then the initial change in deposits cannot be included in the total change in the money supply. However, if the initial change in deposits comes from a purchase of bonds by the central bank, then the money supply will increase by the money multiplier times the initial change in deposits.